Question one, which of the following adaptations occurs in the cardiovascular system as a result of chronic endurance training? A, decreased stroke volume at rest. B, increased maximal cardiac output. C, reduced capillary density in muscle tissue. D, decreased VOMAX. Correct answer. B, increased maximal cardiac output. Explanation. Chronic endurance training typically leads to an increase in stroke volume and cardiac output during maximal exercise. This is due to enhanced cardiac efficiency and increased blood volume. The capillary density in muscle tissue also increases, aiding in oxygen delivery and utilization. Bomax generally increases, reflecting improved aerobic capacity. Question 2. What mechanism explains the initial rapid increase in heart rate at the onset of exercise? A. Increased sympathetic stimulation. B. Decreased parasympathetic withdrawal. C. Increased parasympathetic stimulation. D. Decreased sympathetic withdrawal. Correct answer. A. Increased sympathetic stimulation. Explanation. At the onset of exercise, the autonomic nervous system responds with increased sympathetic stimulation and decreased parasympathetic activity. This leads to a rapid increase in heart rate to meet the rising demands of the working muscles. The balance between these systems is critical for heart rate regulation during exercise. Question 3. In which part of the respiratory system does the primary gas exchange occur during exercise? A. Bronchi. B. Alveoli. C. Trachea. D. Bronchioles. Correct answer. B. Alveoli. Explanation. Gas exchange primarily occurs in the alveoli, tiny air sacs in the lungs where oxygen diffuses into the blood and carbon dioxide is expelled. The efficiency of this process is critical for maintaining oxygen supply during exercise especially at high intensities. Question 4. When performing a barbell back squat, which of the following cues is most important for maintaining proper form and preventing injury? A. Keep the knees locked throughout the movement. B. Allow the knees to track inside the toes. C. Keep the chest up and back flat. D. Push the hips forward to initiate the movement. Correct answer. C. Keep the chest up and back flat. Explanation. Maintaining a neutral spine with the chest up and back flat is essential for performing a safe and effective barbell back squat. This posture helps distribute the load properly and reduces the risk of injury to the lower back and knees. Allowing the knees to track inside the toes or locking the knees can lead to improper form and increased injury risk. Question 5. Which of the following is a key factor in determining the proper load for a hypertrophy-focused resistance training program? A. Number of repetitions performed. B. Length of rest intervals. C. Speed of execution. D. The percentage of one repetition maximum on arm. Correct answer. D. The percentage of one repetition maximum on arm. Explanation. The percentage of one repetition maximum on arm is critical in determining the load for hypertrophy training. Typically, loads ranging from 6-5-8-5% of on arm are used allowing for moderate repetitions and sufficient time under tension to stimulate muscle growth. The number of repetitions, rest intervals, and execution speed also play roles but are secondary to load percentage. Question 6. In a clean and jerk exercise, what is the primary reason for utilizing a hook grip? A. To reduce wrist flexion. B. To enhance grip strength and prevent the bar from slipping. C. To improve shoulder mobility. D. To decrease the load on the forearm muscles. Correct answer. B. To enhance grip strength and prevent the bar from slipping. Explanation. The hook grip involves wrapping the thumb around the bar and then wrapping the fingers over the thumb, significantly improving grip strength. This is crucial in the clean and jerk to prevent the bar from slipping during the explosive phases of the lift, especially when handling heavy loads. Question 7. Which periodization model involves systematically varying training volume and intensity over shorter cycles to prevent plateaus and overtraining? A. Block periodization. B. Linear periodization. C. Daily undulating periodization. D. Concurrent periodization. Correct answer. C. Daily undulating periodization. Explanation. Daily undulating periodization, DUP, involves frequent changes in training variables such as volume and intensity within a weekly or even daily structure. This approach helps prevent plateaus by constantly providing new stimuli to the body, reducing the risk of overtraining and allowing for more frequent peaks in performance. 
Question 8. When designing a strength and power program for an athlete, which of the following exercise orders would be most appropriate to optimize performance? A. Isolation exercises before compound movements. B. Lower body exercises before upper body exercises. C. Power exercises. E. G. Cleans before strength exercises. E. G. Squats. D. Endurance exercises before strength exercises. Correct answer. C. Power exercises. E. G. Cleans before strength exercises. E. G. Squats. Explanation. Performing power exercises before strength exercises is a fundamental principle in program design, especially for athletes. Power exercises require high levels of neuromuscular coordination and are best performed when the athlete is not fatigued. This sequence ensures optimal performance and reduces the risk of injury. Question 9. During a tapering phase leading up to competition, which of the following adjustments is most commonly made to the training program? A. Increase in training volume. B. Increase in training intensity. C. Decrease in training frequency. D. Reduction in training volume. Correct answer. D. Reduction in training volume. Explanation. Tapering typically involves a reduction in training volume while maintaining or slightly increasing intensity. This approach allows the athlete's body to recover and supercompensate, leading to peak performance during competition. Decreasing training frequency may also be a part of tapering, but volume reduction is the primary focus. Question 10. Scenario. Emily, a collegiate sprinter, is experiencing consistent hamstring tightness during her speed training sessions. She has an important competition in three weeks. As her strength and conditioning coach, what would be the most appropriate course of action? A. Increase her sprinting volume to build resilience. B. Integrate more aggressive hamstring stretching into her routine. C. Reduce sprinting intensity and volume while focusing on hamstring strengthening and flexibility exercises. D. Advise complete rest until the competition. Correct answer. C. Reduce sprinting intensity and volume while focusing on hamstring strengthening and flexibility exercises. Explanation. In cases of consistent muscle tightness, particularly with the competition approaching, it's important to reduce the intensity and volume of the aggravating activity, sprinting in this case, while focusing on corrective strategies like strengthening and flexibility exercises. This approach can address the underlying issue and prevent injury while still preparing the athlete for competition. Question 11. Which of the following macronutrients is primarily responsible for fueling high-intensity, short-duration exercises such as weightlifting, A. Fats, B. Proteins, C. Carbohydrates, D. Fiber? Correct answer. C. Carbohydrates. Explanation. Carbohydrates are the primary source of energy during high-intensity, short-duration exercises. They are stored in muscles as glycogen and rapidly converted to glucose to fuel anaerobic activities like weightlifting. Fats and proteins are less efficient for quick energy production in such scenarios. Question 12. What is the role of dietary fat in an athlete's diet, particularly for endurance athletes? A. Providing a rapid source of energy during high-intensity activities. B. Supporting anabolic hormone production and long-duration energy needs. C. Serving as the primary energy source during all exercise types. D. Stimulating muscle protein synthesis. Correct answer. B. Supporting anabolic hormone production and long-duration energy needs. Explanation. Dietary fat plays a critical role in the diet of endurance athletes by supporting hormone production, including testosterone and growth hormone, and providing a sustained energy source during long-duration, lower-intensity activities. While carbohydrates are the primary fuel for high-intensity activities, fats are crucial for endurance. Question 13. Which of the following describes the glycemic index, G, and its relevance to an athlete's nutritional strategy? A. A measure of protein quality based on essential amino acids. B. The amount of energy required to digest, absorb, and metabolize food. C. A ranking of carbohydrates based on their effect on blood glucose levels. D. The ratio of carbohydrate to protein in a post-exercise meal. Correct answer. C. A ranking of carbohydrates based on their effect on blood glucose levels. Explanation. The glycemic index. G. Ranks carbohydrates based on how quickly they raise blood glucose levels after consumption. 
Athletes can use this information to strategically time their carbohydrate intake, choosing high ghee foods for quick energy before or during exercise, and low ghee foods for sustained energy over longer periods. Question 14. Which of the following strategies is most effective for reducing the risk of overuse injuries in athletes? A. Increasing training volume gradually. B. Ensuring athletes use the same training surface for all workouts. C. Focusing solely on sport-specific exercises. D. Implementing a consistent high-intensity training program year-round. Correct answer. A. Increasing training volume gradually. Explanation. Gradually increasing training volume is key to minimizing the risk of overuse injuries. This allows the body to adapt to increased demands without excessive strain. Using varied training surfaces and incorporating cross-training can also help reduce repetitive stress on specific muscles and joints. Question 15. What is the primary purpose of conducting a pre-participation physical examination, PP, for athletes? A. To assess an athlete's performance capabilities. B. To determine an athlete's nutritional deficiencies. C. To identify potential health risks and prevent injury. D. To diagnose chronic conditions that require medical treatment. Correct answer. C. To identify potential health risks and prevent injury. Explanation. The primary purpose of a pre-participation physical examination, PPE, is to identify any health risks that could predispose an athlete to injury or illness during training or competition. This includes screening for cardiovascular, musculoskeletal, and other systemic conditions that may require further evaluation or intervention. Question 16. During a team training session, an athlete collapses and is unresponsive. What is the first step you should take as a coach? A. Begin chest compressions. B. Check for breathing and pulse. C. Call for emergency medical services. M. D. Administer an automated external defibrillator. E. Correct answer. B. Check for breathing and pulse. Explanation. The first step when an athlete collapses and is unresponsive is to check for breathing and pulse. This assessment helps determine whether the athlete is in cardiac arrest or another life-threatening condition. If there is no breathing or pulse, you should immediately call for E. MS, begin chest compressions, and use an AE, D if available. Question 17. Scenario. John, a high school football player, complains of persistent lower back pain after training sessions. He mentions that it worsens during heavy lifting and sprints, as his coach. What action would you take? A. Instruct him to push through the pain to build resilience. B. Recommend. A complete rest from all activities until the pain subsides. C. Modify his training program to reduce the load on his lower back and incorporate core strengthening exercises. D. Focus on stretching his hamstrings and lower back before each session. Correct answer. C. Modify his training program to reduce the load on his lower back and incorporate core strengthening exercises. Explanation. Persistent lower back pain, especially when exacerbated by certain activities, should not be ignored. Modifying John's training program to reduce the load on his lower back and incorporating core strengthening exercises can help address the root cause of his discomfort. Stretching may help, but it should not be the sole intervention. Complete rest is not recommended unless advised by a medical professional. Question 18. Which of the following tests is most appropriate for assessing an athlete's anaerobic power? A. Owner and bench press. B. Wingate anaerobic test. C. Vomax test. D. Sit and reach test. Correct answer. B. Wingate anaerobic test. Explanation. The Wingate anaerobic test is designed to measure anaerobic power, which is the ability to generate high power output in a short period. It involves a 30-second all-out cycling effort, making it an excellent assessment for sports requiring explosive power. The owner bench press assesses strength, Bomax test evaluates aerobic capacity, and the sit and reach test measures flexibility. Question 19. When conducting a owner and test for an athlete, what is the primary consideration to ensure accurate and safe results? A. Maximizing the number of warm-up sets. B. Encouraging the athlete to lift as quickly as possible. C. Ensuring proper technique and spotting. D. Using the heaviest possible starting weight. Correct answer. C. Ensuring proper technique and spotting. Explanation. Proper technique and spotting are essential when conducting a owner test to ensure the athlete's safety and the accuracy of the results. The athlete should perform the lift with controlled speed 
and warm ups that should gradually increase in intensity to prepare for the maximum lift. Starting with a moderate weight is recommended to assess the athlete's capacity. Question 20. Which assessment is used to evaluate an athlete's flexibility, particularly in the hamstrings and lower back? A. Vertical jump test. B. Winged anaerobic test. C. Sit and reach test. D. Owner and deadlift. Correct answer. C. Sit and reach test. Explanation. The sit and reach test is a common assessment used to evaluate flexibility in the hamstrings and lower back. It requires the athlete to reach forward as far as possible while seated, providing a measure of flexibility that is relevant for activities requiring a range of motion in these muscle groups. Question 21. Which of the following is a key ethical responsibility for strength and conditioning professionals when working with athletes? A. Ensuring that all athletes achieve personal records. B. Prescribing nutritional supplements. C. Maintaining confidentiality of athlete information. D. Prioritizing competitive success over athlete well-being. Correct answer. C. Maintaining confidentiality of athlete information. Explanation. Maintaining the confidentiality of athlete information is a critical ethical responsibility for strength and conditioning professionals. This includes protecting personal health data and respecting the privacy of athletes. Prescribing nutritional supplements should be done cautiously and within legal and professional guidelines. An athlete well-being should always take precedence over competitive success. Question 22. In a situation where an athlete sustains a minor injury during training, what is the most appropriate first step for a strength and conditioning coach? A. Immediately refer the athlete to a physician. B. Continue training at a lower intensity. C. Conduct an on-site evaluation and provide basic first aid. D. Allow the athlete to self-assess the injury. Correct answer. C. Conduct an on-site evaluation and provide basic first aid. Explanation. Conducting an on-site evaluation and providing basic first aid is the most appropriate initial response to a minor injury. This allows the coach to assess the severity of the injury and determine the next steps, such as whether the athlete needs to be referred to a medical professional or can continue training with modifications. Question 23. Which legal concept is most relevant when a coach fails to provide the expected standard of care resulting in an athlete's injury? A. Assumption of risk. B. Informed consent. C. Negligence. D. Vicarious liability. Correct answer. C. Negligence. Explanation. Negligence occurs when a coach or trainer fails to provide the expected standard of care, leading to injury or harm to an athlete. This legal concept is central to many liability cases in sports and fitness, emphasizing the importance of adhering to established protocols and safety guidelines. Question 24. Scenario. Sarah, an experienced runner, has been experiencing knee pain during her long-distance training runs. The pain intensifies during downhill running and persists even after rest. She is preparing for a marathon in eight weeks. As her coach, what would you advise? They increase the intensity of her downhill training to strengthen her knees. B. Incorporate cross-training activities like swimming or cycling to reduce knee stress while maintaining cardiovascular fitness. C. Ignore the pain and focus on building mileage for the marathon. D. Advise her to switch to a different sport to avoid further injury. Correct answer. B. Incorporate cross-training activities like swimming or cycling to reduce knee stress while maintaining cardiovascular fitness. Explanation. Cross-training can help Sarah maintain her cardiovascular fitness without placing additional stress on her knees. This approach allows her to stay in shape for the marathon while addressing the underlying issue. Ignoring the pain or increasing training intensity could worsen the condition, potentially sidelining her from the event altogether. Question 25. Which of the following is an effective strategy for enhancing an athlete's motivation during off-season training? A. Focusing solely on skill development. B. Setting specific, measurable, and achievable goals. C. Reducing the frequency of training sessions. D. Eliminating all competition-related activities. Correct answer. B. Setting specific, measurable, and achievable goals. Explanation. Setting specific, measurable, and achievable goals is a proven strategy for maintaining and enhancing motivation during the off-season. 
This approach helps athletes stay focused, monitor progress, and maintain a sense of purpose in their training. Skill development and periodic competition-related activities can also contribute to motivation, but goal setting is key. Question 26. Which psychological technique is most effective in helping athletes manage performance anxiety? A. Positive self-talk. B. Increasing the intensity of training. C. Avoiding high-pressure situations. D. Focusing on outcome goals. Correct answer. A. Positive self-talk. Explanation. Positive self-talk involves using affirmations and encouraging thoughts to boost confidence and reduce anxiety. This technique helps athletes manage performance anxiety by shifting their focus from fear and doubt to self-assurance and control. Focusing on process goals rather than outcomes can also reduce anxiety by emphasizing aspects within the athlete's control. Question 27. What is the primary benefit of using mental imagery in sports performance? A. Improving physical conditioning. B. Enhancing tactical knowledge. C. Developing. A stronger work ethic. D. Reinforcing motor skills and mental preparation. Correct answer. D. Reinforcing motor skills and mental preparation. Explanation. Mental imagery or visualization helps athletes reinforce motor skills and mentally prepare for competition. By imagining successful performances and rehearsing movements in their minds, athletes can improve their focus, confidence, and readiness for competition. While mental imagery can indirectly enhance tactical knowledge and work at its primary benefit lies in motor skills and preparation. Question 28. Scenario. Alex, a collegiate soccer player, has been struggling with maintaining focus during games, leading to missed opportunities. He reports feeling distracted by the crowd and worries about making mistakes. As his sports psychologist, what technique would you recommend? A. Avoiding crowds by playing only in away games. B. Practicing mindfulness and focus drills during training sessions. C. Increasing physical conditioning to improve concentration. D. Encouraging him to focus solely on winning. Correct answer. B. Practicing mindfulness and focus drills during training sessions. Explanation. Mindfulness and focus drills can help Alex improve his concentration during games by training his mind to stay present and reduce distractions. These techniques teach athletes to control their attention and maintain focus on the task at hand, which can enhance performance. Avoiding crowds or focusing solely on winning may increase anxiety and hinder performance. Question 29. Which of the following best describes periodization in a strength and conditioning program? A. A random variation of exercises to avoid monotony. B. The systematic planning of training variables over time to optimize performance. C. An increase in training intensity while reducing volume. D. A focus on sport-specific skills year-round. Correct answer. B. The systematic planning of training variables over time to optimize performance. Explanation. Periodization is the systematic planning of training variables such as intensity, volume, and frequency over time. This approach allows athletes to peak at the right moment while reducing the risk of overtraining and injury. Periodization includes phases of general preparation, specific preparation, competition, and recovery. Question 30. When designing a periodized training program, which phase is typically focused on building an athlete's foundational strength and endurance? A. Competition phase. B. Transition phase. C. Preparatory phase. D. Peaking phase. Correct answer. C. Preparatory phase. Explanation. The preparatory phase of periodization is focused on building an athlete's foundational strength and endurance. This phase lays the groundwork for more intense and sport-specific training that occurs later in the program. It typically includes a higher volume of general conditioning exercises and gradually transitions to more specific training as competition approaches. Question 31. Which of the following is a primary benefit of consuming carbohydrates immediately after exercise? A. Enhance muscle protein synthesis. B. Replenishment of muscle glycogen stores. C. Increase fat oxidation. D. Reduce muscle soreness. Correct answer. B. Replenishment of muscle glycogen stores. Explanation. Consuming carbohydrates immediately after exercise helps replenish muscle glycogen stores that have been depleted during physical activity. While protein consumption is crucial for muscle protein synthesis, carbohydrates are key for restoring glycogen, 
increase fat oxidation and reduce muscle soreness are not directly influenced by post-exercise carbohydrate intake. Question 32. Which nutrient is most important for muscle repair and growth following intense strength training? A. Carbohydrates. B. Protein. C. Fats. D. Fiber. Correct answer. B. Protein. Explanation. Protein is essential for muscle repair and growth following intense strength training because it provides the amino acids needed for muscle protein synthesis. While carbohydrates help replenish glycogen stores and fats are important for overall health, protein is specifically crucial for repairing and building muscle tissue. Question 33. What is the recommended protein intake range for athletes involved in strength training to support muscle hypertrophy? A. 0.8 1.2 grams per kilogram of body weight, B, 1.2, 1.7 grams per kilogram of body weight, C, 1.7, 2.2 grams per kilogram of body weight, D, 2.2, 2.7 grams per kilogram of body weight. Correct answer, C, 1.7, 2.2 grams per kilogram of body weight. Explanation, for athletes involved in strength training aiming to support muscle hypertrophy, the recommended protein intake is generally 1.7, 2.2 grams per kilogram of body weight. This range supports optimal muscle repair and growth. Lower ranges may not provide sufficient support for maximal muscle development. Question 34. Scenario. Emily, a long-distance runner, is experiencing fatigue in her performance despite following a well-structured training program. Her diet includes minimal carbohydrate intake. As her nutritionist, what would be the most appropriate recommendation? A. Increase her carbohydrate intake to better support endurance training. B. Reduce her overall caloric intake to improve weight management. C. Focus on increasing her protein intake to enhance recovery. D. Incorporate more fats into her diet to boost energy levels. Correct answer. A. Increase her carbohydrate intake to better support endurance training. Explanation. Increasing carbohydrate intake is crucial for endurance athletes like Emily, as carbohydrates are the primary fuel source for long-duration exercise. Adequate carbohydrate intake helps maintain glycogen stores and prevents fatigue, which can impair performance. While protein and fats are also important, they do not directly address the immediate energy needs for endurance training. Question 35. Which consideration is most important when designing a training program for elderly individuals? A. High-intensity interval training, A. As the primary focus. B. Emphasis on strength training with progressive overload. C. Avoidance of all forms of cardiovascular exercise. D. Prioritizing flexibility exercises over strength training. Correct answer. B. Emphasis on strength training with progressive overload. Explanation. Strength training with progressive overload is crucial for elderly individuals to combat muscle loss, improve functional strength, and enhance overall mobility. While cardiovascular exercise is also important for overall health, strength training helps address age-related declines in muscle mass and strength. HIIT may be too intense for some elderly individuals, and flexibility is important but should not replace strength training. Question 36. What is a key consideration when training pregnant women to ensure safety and effectiveness? A. Avoiding all forms of resistance training. B. Monitoring heart rate and adjusting intensity based on guidelines. C. Encouraging high impact activities to maintain bone density. D. Emphasizing static stretching as the main exercise modality. Correct answer. B. Monitoring heart rate and adjusting intensity based on guidelines. Explanation. Monitoring heart rate and adjusting exercise intensity according to established guidelines is essential for ensuring the safety and effectiveness of a training program for pregnant women. This approach helps accommodate the physiological changes that occur during pregnancy and reduces the risk of complications. Resistance training can be safe if done appropriately, and high-impact activities may not be recommended depending on individual circumstances. Question 37. Scenario. Mark, a 45-year-old male with type 2 diabetes, is looking to start an exercise program to manage his blood glucose levels. What should be the primary focus of his initial training program? A. High-intensity strength training with minimal rest periods. B. Long-duration, low-intensity aerobic exercise. C. Aggressive weight loss through calorie restriction and exercise. 
flexibility training with minimal cardiovascular activity? Correct answer. B, long duration, low intensity aerobic exercise. Explanation. For individuals with type 2 diabetes, long duration, low intensity aerobic exercise is often recommended as the initial focus to help manage blood glucose levels and improve cardiovascular health. This type of exercise can help enhance insulin sensitivity and aid in blood glucose control. While strength training and flexibility are important, starting with aerobic exercise provides a manageable and effective approach for improving metabolic health. Question 38. Which of the following is a primary goal of rehabilitation following a ligament sprain? A. Immediate return to high-intensity sports. B. Restoration of range of motion and strength. C. Complete immobilization of the injured area. D. Focus solely on pain management. Correct answer. B. Restoration of range of motion and strength. Explanation. The primary goal of rehabilitation following a ligament sprain is to restore range of motion and strength. This helps ensure proper healing, prevent future injuries, and return the athlete to their previous level of function. While pain management and immobilization may be part of the initial treatment, the focus shifts to active rehabilitation to promote recovery and functional performance. Question 39. What is the most effective method for preventing overuse injuries in runners? A. Increasing weekly mileage by 20% each week. B. Using the same pair of running shoes for all runs. C. Incorporating a variety of surfaces and cross-training into the training regimen. D. Avoiding any change in running pace or distance. Correct answer. C. Incorporating a variety of surfaces and cross-training into the training regimen. Explanation. Incorporating a variety of surfaces and cross-training helps reduce the repetitive stress on specific body parts, which is crucial for preventing overuse injuries in runners. Bearing surfaces and integrating different forms of exercise can decrease the risk of injuries related to repetitive impact and strain. Gradual increases in mileage are important, but variety in training is key for injury prevention. Question 40. Scenario. Lisa, a competitive swimmer, reports recurring shoulder pain during her strokes. She has a history of rotator cuff injuries. What would be the most appropriate intervention to address her condition? A. Increasing swim volume and intensity to strengthen the shoulder. B. Ignoring the pain and continuing her regular training routine. C. Implementing shoulder-specific strengthening exercises and reviewing stroke technique. D. Limiting shoulder movement to prevent further injury. Correct answer. C. Implementing shoulder-specific strengthening exercises and reviewing stroke technique. Explanation. Implementing shoulder-specific strengthening exercises and reviewing stroke technique are crucial for addressing rotator cuff injuries and preventing further shoulder pain. Strengthening the shoulder muscles and correcting any technique issues can help reduce strain and promote healing. Simply increasing swim volume or ignoring the pain could exacerbate the injury, and limiting shoulder movement may not address the underlying issue effectively. Question 41. In a periodized training program, what is the primary focus during the hypertrophy phase? A. Maximizing power output through explosive movements. B. Increasing muscular endurance by performing high repetitions. C. Building muscle mass through moderate to high volume and moderate intensity. D. Enhancing skill-specific performance with low volume and high intensity. Correct answer. C. Building muscle mass through moderate to high volume and moderate intensity. Explanation. The hypertrophy phase in a periodized training program focuses on building muscle mass. This phase typically involves moderate to high volume and moderate intensity with the aim of increasing muscle size. While power output and muscular endurance are important in other phases, the hypertrophy phase is specifically designed to target muscle growth through controlled, repetitive stress. Question 42. Which of the following is a key consideration when designing a conditioning program for an athlete involved in multiple sports? A. Focusing solely on sport-specific skills to enhance performance. B. Incorporating a balance of aerobic and anaerobic training to improve overall fitness. C. Prioritizing maximal strength training over all other forms of exercise. D. Limiting training frequency to prevent overtraining and fatigue. Correct answer. B. Incorporating a balance of aerobic and anaerobic training to improve overall fitness. Explanation. For athletes involved in multiple sports, 
a balanced conditioning program that includes both aerobic and anaerobic training is essential for improving overall fitness and performance. This approach ensures that athletes are well prepared for the varied demands of different sports, enhancing their endurance, speed, and recovery. Solely focusing on sport-specific skills or strength training may not address the diverse needs of multi-sport athletes. Question 43. What is the primary purpose of a the load week eco periodized training program? A. To maximize training intensity and performance gains. B. To allow for recovery and prevent overtraining by reducing training volume and intensity. C. To introduce new exercises and techniques to enhance training variety. D. To increase caloric intake and support muscle growth. Correct answer. B. To allow for recovery and prevent overtraining by reducing training volume and intensity. Explanation. A the load week is designed to allow for recovery and prevent overtraining by reducing training volume and intensity. This period of decreased training load helps the body recover from accumulated stress and prepares the athlete for the next training cycle. While increasing intensity or introducing new exercises may be part of other phases, the primary goal of a the load week is to manage fatigue and support long-term progress. Question 44. Scenario. James, a collegiate soccer player, has been experiencing declining performance and frequent fatigue despite following his training program. After reviewing his training log, you notice that he has been consistently increasing his training volume without adequate rest. What should be your primary recommendation to address his performance issues? A. Continue increasing training volume to push through the plateau. B. Reduce training volume and incorporate additional rest days to allow for recovery. C. Increases protein intake significantly to improve recovery. D. Focus on skill-based drills to enhance technical performance. Correct answer. B. Reduce training volume and incorporate additional rest days to allow for recovery. Explanation. If James is experiencing declining performance and fatigue due to increasing training volume without sufficient rest, reducing the training volume and incorporating additional rest days are critical to allow for recovery. This approach helps prevent overtraining and support the body's ability to adapt and improve. While adjusting nutrition and focusing on skill-based drills are also important, recovery should be the immediate focus to address performance issues. Question 45. Which of the following strategies is most effective for reducing the risk of ACL injuries in athletes? A. Performing high-intensity plyometric exercises with minimal technique emphasis. B. Strengthening the hamstrings and promoting proper landing techniques. C. Avoiding any forms of lower body strength training. D. Emphasizing endurance training over strength training. Correct answer. B. Strengthening the hamstrings and promoting proper landing techniques. Explanation. Strengthening the hamstrings and promoting proper landing techniques are effective strategies for reducing the risk of ACL injuries. Hamstring strength helps balance the forces around the knee joint while proper landing techniques reduce the risk of excessive stress on the ACL. High-intensity plyometric exercises, avoiding lower body strength training, and focusing solely on endurance training do not address the specific risk factors associated with ACL injuries. Question 46. What is the primary goal of a pre-participation physical examination for athletes? A. To evaluate the athlete's cardiovascular endurance and muscular strength. B. To identify any existing medical conditions or risk factors that may affect safe participation in sports. C. To provide a baseline measure of the athlete's performance capabilities. D. To design a personalized training program based on the athlete's fitness level. Correct answer. B. To identify any existing medical conditions or risk factors that may affect safe participation in sports. Explanation. The primary goal of a pre-participation physical examination is to identify any existing medical conditions or risk factors that may affect the athlete's safety during sports participation. This evaluation helps ensure that athletes are cleared to participate and can help prevent potential health issues or injuries. While performance evaluations and training program design are important, they are not the primary focus of the pre-participation physical examination. Question 47. Scenario. Rachel, a competitive volleyball player, reports frequent lower back pain that worsens during matches. She has recently increased her training intensity and frequency. What is the most appropriate first step in addressing her lower back pain? A. Prescribe. A regimen of intensive core strengthening exercises. 
B. Recommend a complete cessation of all physical activity until the pain subsides. C. Evaluate her training program for potential overtraining and implement modifications. D. Increase the volume of her strength training to build overall muscle mass. Correct answer. C. Evaluate her training program for potential overtraining and implement modifications. Explanation. Evaluating Rachel's training program for potential overtraining and implementing modifications is the most appropriate first step. Overtraining can contribute to pain and injury, and addressing training intensity and frequency can help alleviate symptoms. Walk or strengthening exercises may be beneficial and complete cessation may be necessary in some cases. Modifying the training program is crucial for addressing the root cause of the issue. Question 48. What is the primary benefit of setting specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound, smart goals in a training program? A. To ensure that training sessions are more enjoyable and varied. B. To provide clear, structured objectives that enhance motivation and track progress. C. To simplify the process of designing training programs. D. To focus solely on short-term performance improvements. Correct answer. B. To provide clear, structured objectives that enhance motivation and track progress. Explanation. Setting SMART goals provides clear, structured objectives that enhance motivation and allow for tracking progress effectively. These goals help ensure that athletes have well-defined targets to work towards, which can improve focus and commitment. While making training enjoyable and varied is important, SMART goals specifically help in setting and achieving long-term performance and development objectives. Question 49. Which psychological strategy is most effective for improving an athlete's performance under pressure? A. Visualization of successful performance and relaxation techniques. B. Increasing the volume of training to build confidence. C. Avoiding competition to reduce stress and pressure. D. Focusing solely on physical conditioning without addressing mental aspects. Correct answer. A. Visualization of successful performance and relaxation techniques. Explanation. Visualization of successful performance and relaxation techniques are effective psychological strategies for improving an athlete's performance under pressure. These strategies help athletes manage anxiety, enhance focus, and boost confidence. Increasing training volume or avoiding competition may not directly address the mental aspects of performance, and focusing solely on physical conditioning overlooks the importance of psychological readiness. Question 50. Scenario. David, a high-level swimmer experiences significant anxiety before major competitions, which negatively impacts his performance. What is the most appropriate intervention to help him manage his pre-competition anxiety? It increases swim training volume to boost his confidence. B. Implement a structured mental training program that includes relaxation techniques and cognitive restructuring. C. Limit his participation in competitions to reduce anxiety exposure. D. Focus solely on physical conditioning to ensure he is in peak physical shape. Correct answer. B. Implement a structured mental training program that includes relaxation techniques and cognitive restructuring. Explanation. Implementing a structured mental training program that includes relaxation techniques and cognitive restructuring is the most appropriate intervention for managing pre-competition anxiety. These methods help athletes develop coping strategies, manage stress, and improve mental readiness. Increasing training volume or limiting competition exposure may not effectively address the psychological aspects of anxiety, and focusing solely on physical conditioning overlooks the importance of mental preparation. Question 51. What is the primary purpose of conducting a vertical jump test in a strength and conditioning program? A. To assess aerobic endurance and overall cardiovascular health. B. To measure upper body strength and muscular endurance. C. To evaluate lower body explosive power and jumping ability. D. To determine flexibility and range of motion in the lower body. Correct answer. C. To evaluate lower body explosive power and jumping ability. Explanation. The vertical jump test is primarily used to evaluate lower body explosive power and jumping ability. This test assesses the capacity of the lower body muscles to generate force quickly, which is crucial for activities requiring powerful leg movements. While aerobic endurance, upper body strength, and flexibility are important aspects of overall fitness, they are not the primary focus of the vertical jump test. Question 52. Which method is most appropriate for assessing an athlete's body composition? A. Skinfold measurements using calipers. B. 
performance on a 40-yard dash. C. Vomax testing on a treadmill. D. Isokinetic strength testing of the lower limbs. Correct answer. A. Skinfold measurements using calipers. Explanation. Skinfold measurements using calipers are a common and appropriate method for assessing body composition. This technique estimates body fat percentage by measuring the thickness of skin folds at specific sites on the body. Performance tests and strength assessments do not directly measure body composition, and Vomax testing focuses on aerobic capacity rather than body fat percentage. Question 53. What is the main advantage of using a submaximal exercise test over a maximal exercise test? A. It requires less specialized equipment and is less expensive. B. It provides a more accurate measurement of cardiovascular fitness. C. It allows for the assessment of maximal strength and power. D. It is less likely to induce fatigue or risk of injury for the participant. Correct answer. D. It is less likely to induce fatigue or risk of injury for the participant. Explanation. Submaximal exercise tests are advantageous because they are less likely to induce fatigue or risk of injury compared to maximal exercise tests. These tests assess fitness at lower intensities, reducing the risk associated with high-intensity exertion. While submaximal tests may be less precise than maximal tests for certain measures, they are safer and more accessible for a wider range of participants. Question 54. Scenario. Emily, a track athlete, reports that her arm strength test for the squad has plateaued despite consistent training. After reviewing her program, you find that she has been performing high-intensity squats with minimal variation in her routine. What should you recommend to help her break through the plateau? A. Increase the frequency of squat workouts to build strength. B. Introduce variation in her squat routine, such as different squat variations or accessory exercises. C. Decrease her training volume significantly to prevent overtraining. D. Focus exclusively on improving her technique without changing the training routine. Correct answer. B. Introduce variation in her squat routine, such as different squat variations or accessory exercises. Explanation. Introducing variation in the squat routine, such as different squat variations or accessory exercises, can help Emily break through a strength plateau by challenging her muscles in new ways and addressing potential weaknesses. Increasing frequency or decreasing volume may not effectively address the underlying issues, and focusing solely on technique might not provide the stimulus needed for strength improvements. Question 55. Which of the following is a fundamental principle of the NSCA Code of Ethics? A. Providing personalized training programs based solely on popular trends. B. Ensuring the safety and well-being of clients through adherence to professional standards. C. Accepting all clients regardless of their goals or fitness levels. D. Prioritizing personal gain and financial incentives over client welfare. Correct answer. B. Ensuring the safety and well-being of clients through adherence to professional standards. Explanation. Ensuring the safety and well-being of clients through adherence to professional standards is a fundamental principle of the NSEA Code of Ethics. This principle emphasizes the importance of maintaining high standards of practice and prioritizing client welfare above all else. Providing programs based on trends or prioritizing personal gain does not align with ethical practice, and accepting all clients may not always be feasible if it compromises safety or effectiveness. Question 56. What is an important consideration when establishing a client-trainer relationship to foster trust and respect? A. Using technical jargon to impress the client with knowledge. B. Establishing clear communication channels and setting realistic expectations. C. Maintaining a strict, authoritative approach to ensure compliance. D. Avoiding personal interactions to maintain professional boundaries. Correct answer. B. Establishing clear communication channels and setting realistic expectations. Explanation. Establishing clear communication channels and setting realistic expectations are crucial for fostering trust and respect in the client-trainer relationship. Effective communication helps build a strong rapport and ensures that clients understand their goals, progress, and the training process. Using jargon, being overly authoritative, or avoiding personal interactions may hinder relationship building and client engagement. Question 57. Which of the following best describes the role of continuing education for strength and conditioning professionals? A. To maintain current certification status and stay informed about industry trends. 
b to focus exclusively on gaining new certifications without practical application c to limit learning to areas directly related to personal training techniques d to reduce professional development costs by avoiding workshops and seminars correct answer a to maintain current certification status and stay informed about industry trends explanation continuing education helps strength and conditioning professionals maintain their certification status and stay informed about industry trends and advancements it ensures that practitioners remain up to date with the latest research and best practices enhancing their effectiveness and credibility focusing solely on certifications or limiting learning may not provide a comprehensive view of the field and avoiding professional development opportunities can hinder growth question 58 scenario mark a new strength and conditioning coach is working with a diverse group of clients including athletes from various sports and individuals with different fitness levels what should mark prioritize to ensure he meets the needs of all his clients effectively a standardizing training programs across all clients to simplify planning b customizing training programs based on individual goals needs and abilities c focusing on advanced training techniques to impress clients and demonstrate expertise d relying solely on general fitness principles without considering individual differences correct answer b customizing training programs based on individual goals needs and abilities explanation customizing training programs based on individual goals needs and abilities is essential for effectively meeting the diverse requirements of clients personalization ensures that each client receives a program tailored to their specific objectives and fitness levels which enhances effectiveness and satisfaction standardizing programs or relying solely on general principles may not address the unique needs of each client question 59 what is the primary mechanism through which muscle hypertrophy occurs in response to resistance training a increased oxygen delivery to muscle tissues b enhanced neural activation of muscle fibers c increased muscle fiber size due to protein synthesis and repair d improved flexibility and range of motion in the muscles correct answer c increased muscle fiber size due to protein synthesis and repair explanation muscle hypertrophy primarily occurs due to increased muscle fiber size as a result of protein synthesis and repair following resistance training this process involves muscle fibers adapting to the mechanical stress placed on them by growing larger and stronger while neural activation and flexibility are important aspects of training they do not directly cause muscle hypertrophy question 60 which of the following factors is most influential in determining an individual's vomax a the amount of time spent performing resistance training b the efficiency of the cardiovascular and respiratory systems in oxygen transport c the type and frequency of plyometric exercises performed d the level of skill in sport specific movements and techniques correct answer b the efficiency of the cardiovascular and respiratory systems in oxygen transport explanation Vomax is most influenced by the efficiency of the cardiovascular and respiratory systems in oxygen transport and utilization it represents the maximum amount of oxygen an individual can use during intense exercise and is a key indicator of aerobic fitness resistance training plyometrics and skill level may impact overall fitness but they are not primary determinants of Vomax. question 61 